Good morning and welcome to Bridgepoint Church Online. My name is Ashley Sears. I'm the director of women's ministry and I wanted to share with you about some cool things that were happening here. So stick around after the service. But right now we are starting a brand new series and I'd like to invite you to join us in a time of worship. Till I 
singing all for me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found. Leaves the mind denied. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still you yourself away all oh, the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God Still your love fought for me You've been so, so good to me When I felt no worth You paid it all for me You've been so, so and you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down why you won't tear down coming after me no there's no shadow you won't
Hey, welcome. We are really glad that you are joining us today online. I also want to let you know that uh, at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, we're gathering together to worship. And so uh, when you're ready, if you're in town, whatever it may be, we would really love to be able to see you on Sunday. And when you think about the things that have happened over the last uh, few months, maybe you've had some of the same questions that I've had. You think about uh, a virus and a pandemic, earthquakes that have happened. I mean, there was a pretty big earthquake that happened here in Idaho just a few days ago. All the things that are occurring, there's, there's the unrest, the uncertainty, the anger. What is going on? And maybe if you've been a Christian for a little bit, you might rephrase that question. Your question might be, are we living in the last days? Is COVID-19, is it mentioned in the Bible? And what about all these earthquakes? I mean, uh, even last week, when we were going through Romans 13, you remember that those last few verses of that chapter, it said, hey, we need to wake up. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. And so we are closer to the time of Jesus' return than what we've been before. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about the end of the world, about prophecy. I mean, there's an entire book written about it, the book of Revelation. So over the next seven weeks, we're going to uh, break down the end of the world, and we're going to do it like this. We're going to call it Playbill for the End of the World. And uh, it's going to help us understand what's going to happen. Now, um, on Becky and I's 25th wedding anniversary, we decided we were going to go somewhere that we had never been before. And so we chose New York City. We had an incredible trip. And since we were in New York City, one of the things that uh, we wanted to see was a Broadway play. And of all the plays that were going on at that time, we chose Phantom of the Opera. Now, I don't know that it'll be too surprising to you to know that uh, my knowledge of opera and classical music is really not all that extensive. And in fact, whatever knowledge I have about opera and classical music, I've pretty much learned from right here. Yep, Bugs Bunny cartoons. You remember, I'll bet you remember, remember? Kill the rabbit, kill the rabbit, kill the rabbit. Okay, I'll, I'll stop. You know, I, I can hear the, the views and TVs turned off even as I'm speaking here. Now, I didn't know much about the Phantom of the Opera, but one of the things that helped is that uh, we got a playbill. And in this playbill, what I found was there was a cast of characters. There was the number of acts, a number of scenes, and it really helped me understand what was going on. So that's how we're going to break down this sermon series. We're going to go through a series of scenes. We're going to go through the cast of characters so that we can have a better understanding about the end of the world. To begin with, let's just start with the words of Jesus. They're found in John chapter number 14, as he is speaking to his disciples on the night before his crucifixion. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Well, that's some pretty good words for right now, isn't it? Trust in God and trust also in me. There are more than enough room in my father's house. If this were not so, would I have told you that? I'm going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Well, these words are the promises of Jesus. And he promised that he would come back and get us how does it work? It hasn't happened so far. What is it that I'm supposed to look for? What do I need to know? Well, this is where the book of Revelation can be a help. I know some of you are pushing back. You're going, well, any time that I've ever 
opened up the book of Revelation, it really seems to be confusing. And yeah, it, it, it can be. But what if we approach it as a play that's unfolding before us? So before we get into the details of the story, it's just good to know the cast of characters. So we'll focus this morning on some of the characters from the book of Revelation. So that as we go through this series, if you hear a name, you go, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I know a little bit about that person or that group of people. So let's, let's start here. Let's start with the Apostle John. He is the author of the book of Revelation. And so when you hear the Apostle John, his name, it's the John that you always think about. Uh, he is the apostle that was called the beloved disciple. Uh, John is the person that Jesus wanted to take care of his mom uh, after he left this world. John, the time frame, is about 95 AD. He has been exiled to an island off the west coast of Turkey by the name of Patmos. And let's take a look at the very first few words that are written here in this book. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. So, uh, an angel presents this revelation to John, and John is supposed to report or to write down the things that he saw. And, and so it's really important that we realize that this is not just John's uh, vivid imagination. Uh, this is not the same as uh, Tolkien writing the Lord of the Rings. I mean, this is what John has been instructed by the Holy Spirit to write, and he is going to see some incredible things, some things, frankly, that are really hard to describe with words, but he is commissioned to write about the things that are and the things that will be. Now, that brings us to the main character of the book. It is Jesus Christ, the Lamb, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. I mean, there's no question that Jesus is the main character of this book. And in fact, the official title of this book is The Revelation of Jesus Christ. And when we view Jesus Christ through this book, well, it's a whole different ballgame in terms of how we viewed him in the Gospels. He is not coming to back to earth the second time as an infant born in a manger Oh no, uh, it is far different than that. In fact, let's kind of jump into a scene that is happening in heaven in Revelation chapter number five. And then I looked, that's John. And I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands. Thousands. In other words, you can't even number them. It's, it, it is impossible to count everybody who is present. Look at the next verse. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. I, I wish I just had a five second YouTube clip of this scene. Because what is happening here in this loud voice, singing in a mighty chorus, this crowd of millions and millions are in a loud voice declaring who Jesus Christ is. They're letting the entire universe know the seven things that he is worthy of. And this character, Jesus Christ, well, he is coming back to earth to judge sin. He's coming back to earth to establish his kingdom here on earth 
and he's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords and everything in the book of Revelation and in fact everything in the Bible and wait a minute let me expand it one more time everything in history everything in the universe all revolves around Jesus Christ now there's a second character we should talk about it's the church we're known as the bride of Christ Christians believers we're described as his body we're described as his bride many times in the Bible Jesus is described as a groom and we are his bride whom he loves and cherishes we'll jump back into chapter uh, 19 and it says let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And the idea here is that uh, we as followers of Jesus Christ, Christians, we are really important to Jesus Christ. And this uh, wedding ceremony and uh, great supper prepared well, there's some just really important imagery that's here. But one of the things that we should know is that between Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 19, there are some really, really awful things that happen. And if, if it's your bride, Jesus as the groom, would you let your bride go through that terrible time of tribulation. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. How about the next cast of characters here? It's the, the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. And I don't know if that surprises you or not, because a lot of times we kind of think of the nation of Israel uh, kind of set aside and, and God's not uh, dealing with them uh, right now. And there might be some truth to that. But God has not finished dealing with the nation of Israel. Oh, when we talk about God's chosen people, that goes all the way back to the Old Testament times with Abraham. And there were a series of promises that were made. They were, they're known as covenants, like the Abrahamic covenant, or the promise or covenant made with David. That's the Davidic covenant. And so uh, Jesus, his disciples, they knew all about these promises and knew that several of these promises had not been fulfilled in their lifetime. And that's why in Acts chapter one, verse number six, it says, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, it wasn't the time for Jesus' kingdom to be restored here on earth or for Israel to be restored but that is coming. Uh, Israel will be restored fully. All the promises of God made to Israel will be uh, fulfilled. And Jesus will come back to this earth to be the physical ruler and reign, and, and reign over the earth. Now, before we move on, just make sure that, that we keep uh, the church separate from the nation of Israel. And that will be useful as we go through this in the next uh, uh, few weeks. Now, how about this? This is the, the villain side of things. Satan, the dragon, the satanic counterfeit to God the Father. Look in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. So that great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil. And Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. This is interesting that in the book of Revelation, this is part of the prequel. In other words, this is going back to the time of the first rebellion where Satan and the angels who followed him were kicked out of heaven. And ever since that happened, his purpose is to deceive the whole world. It started with Adam and Eve, it continues to this day, and it will happen to the very last moment possible. Now think about this. As God is a trinity, 
God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, Satan has his own counterfeit trinity as well. Because that's what Satan does. He's always going to counterfeit who God is and what God does as much as possible. That brings us to the next person in our cast of characters. The beast. The antichrist. A seven head, ten horn, satanic counterfeit to Jesus Christ. Now if you've never heard about any of uh, these characters in the book of Revelation, you have heard about the Antichrist. I mean, throughout the years, different people have been pointed out being the Antichrist. I, I mean, Hitler was supposed to be the Antichrist. And I remember growing up that the Antichrist was Henry Kissinger. I, I know. And right now, there are still people that are being named as the Antichrist. Right now, this is who the Antichrist, okay, well, there might be a little truth to that, uh, but throughout the years, it's been different people. Someone is going to rise to power. Look what Revelation 13, verse 1 through 2 says. Then I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. It had seven heads and ten horns with ten crowns on its thorns. And it was written on each head were the names that blasphemed God. This beast looked like a leopard, but it had the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave the beast his own power and throne and great authority. And it's not crowns on his thorns, it's crowns on his horns. It helps if you read it right. Okay? So, here's what happens. Satan gives the Antichrist authority and power, and he is a formidable adversary. Now look at, look at this next verse. I saw that one of the heads of the beast seemed wounded beyond recovery, but the fatal wound was healed. The whole world marveled at this miracle and gave allegiance to the beast. And what we find here is that there is a severe head wound, an assassination. It is worldwide coverage. Now think about this for a moment. What happened if you go back in time in our history? And we know that President Kennedy was assassinated. And there was worldwide coverage that was given. In this case, you know what? That fatal wound was healed. What would have happened if a week later, if President Kennedy would have come out in the Oval Office and addressed the nation? It would have been unbelievable, right? Well, as a result of this happening, the whole world marveled at this miracle and gave allegiance to the beast. And so there are just an incredible series of things that occur. Now, look at this. This is the next in the cast of characters. The false prophet. He's also known as the second beast. He's a satanic counterfeit to the Holy Spirit. This false prophet has one job, and that is to direct attention and worship to the Antichrist, and there are millions of willing followers. Look at verse number 13, Revelation 13. He did astonishing miracles, talking about the false prophet, even making fire flash down to earth from the sky while everyone was watching. Wow. And all the miracles he was allowed to perform, that's important to know, that he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belong to this world. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. And so, man, people are more than willing to uh, make a statue because this has to be more than just a man if he came back to life, right? The next verse. He was then permitted, this is unbelievable, he was then permitted to give life to the statue so that it could speak. Then the statue of the beast commanded that anyone refusing to worship it must die. Wow. I mean, you, can you imagine either being present 
or watching it on TV to see these things happen. But it doesn't even stop here. In verse 16, he required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. And you know what? Now this is ringing a bell for many of us, right? Oh, wait a minute. I've kind of heard something about that. The next verse says this. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. And then we find in verse number 18, wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So there are so many things that are happening, so many things that this cast of characters are doing. And I'm going to just give you one more in today's cast of characters. It's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And you could read, in, starting in Revelation chapter 6 and verse number 2, about these four horsemen of the apocalypse. Each horse has a different color. Each horse stands for four different things. That white horse represents peace and a treaty that was made. The red horse represents war. The black horse represents famine. And the pale horse represents death. Now, that's just some of the cast of characters. <laughs> Maybe you're going, oh, wait, 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 wait. What about, what about the two witnesses, the 144,000, the 200 million man army, the great multitudes, the seven angels who blow the seven trumpets, the 24 elders, the four living creatures, the mighty angel with the little book, and that list just goes on and on and on. We can't cover them all. Think of them as the chorus, the minor characters that back up the major characters as this plays out. And you know what's gonna play out? God's plan. And because God's plan uh, has played out in the past, and it's playing out right now, and it'll play out in the future as well, I think you and I should heed a little yellow flashing light. Because what you and I have seen over the last few months, a pandemic that has swept across the world. And what has that produced? Well, a lot of things, but I mean, it's produced panic buying, right? And there has been economic collapse, desperation at times, lawlessness, but here's what we have to know. That what we've seen over the last few months is not even close to what it will be. When things that are restraining evil are taken away. Let's do this. Let's, uh, let's do a plot summary. So we have a good feel going into this. Hey, this is what the story is about. The lamb, Jesus Christ, he fulfills his promise to return to earth. He will rescue the redeemed. He will restore the nation of Israel. He'll reckon with sin and he'll reconcile all things to himself. The story closes with everyone in Christ living happily ever after. And when you know what the plot summary is and how things are going to play out, the question that I'm going to leave each of us with is this. Are we ready? As, as a follower of Jesus Christ, are you ready? Have you got things in order? Are, are, are you doing what God has called you to do? Is there anything you need to leave behind? As a non-Christian, maybe that person that uh, you've kind of heard about some of this, but really haven't put the pieces together yet, are you ready? Are you ready to stand before God? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you've got that question mark, you know, you can pray right now. You can ask Christ to forgive you 
of your sins. It's a simple prayer that so many people who are watching right now, they've prayed this prayer, and some people, they prayed it a long time ago, and some people just prayed it recently. It's something like this. It's, it's dear God, I know I've done some things wrong, and I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm sorry. And I want you to come into my life. I'm thankful that you paid the price for my sin. You, you, you died on the cross. You resurrected the third day so that my sin could be forgiven. And I'm asking you to come into my life right here and right now. And if you pray that prayer, Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whatever you need to do, whatever preparation you need to make, you know, the clock is ticking. Because we will never know when the curtain will rise and act one of the revelation of Jesus Christ begins. Let's pray together. God, I'm thankful that we're able to uh, open up your word and be able to see these pieces and, and, and the people, the characters that are found in what is about to happen. I pray, Lord, that uh, more than just being able to answer some trivia questions, I pray, Lord, what this does is it motivates us to make sure that our relationship is right with you. I'm thankful, Lord, for the decisions that are made even right now, and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, talking about decisions, if you prayed that prayer, or if you would like someone to pray with you about something, then here's what you can do. You can just text the word NEXT to this number, 208-826-4433, and we'll be more than glad to be a help to you in any way that we can. Now, next week. Next week is the prologue. In other words, uh, what is going on right now? What is setting everything up? What do we look for? And I'm going to invite you to be back with us next week. Now, for right now, I'm going to kick it back over to Ashley and listen to some of the things that are going on here at Bridgepoint. Thanks again for joining us this morning. As I said before, I want to share a few announcements that we have happening at Bridgepoint. Ladies, for those of you involved, you know how meaningful our online prayer groups have been during this time. Well, we are kicking them off all over again. Starting the week of July 6th, if you want to be involved in our 40-minute online prayer groups, I would love it if you would click on the link below or go to your church center app and join us. One of the really cool things about summers at Bridgepoint Church is we are able to have children's ministry interns. So today, I would like to introduce you to Rachel Berry, our Kids Rock intern for the summer. And she has got a cool announcement just for the kids. Thanks, Ashley. As she said, I'm Rachel Berry, and the kids like to call me Raz. And I'm here to tell you about Kids Rock Pool Parties. Kids. Grab your swimsuit and towel and join us every Wednesday in the month of July from 1 to 3 at Kendra Rasmussen's house. For more information, you can email Kendra at bridgepointchurch.com or check your mailer you got this weekend. We hope to see you there. Now back to you, Ashley. Thanks, Raz. That sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun, and we are so happy to have you join the team this summer. Thank you so much for your faithfulness over the last several months, especially because we have primarily been meeting online, and for your response with camp scholarships. If you would like to financially partner with us, I would like to let you know a few ways you can do that. The first is by using your Church Center app and simply hitting the Give tab. The second way is you can go to bridgepointchurch.com forward slash giving. Lastly, you can pop a check in the mail to the address on your screen or bring it by the church office anytime. However you choose to do that, thank you for your generosity. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you again here next week at 11. And before you log off, don't forget to hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Have a great week.